why King David was anointed three times. The Lord showed me. The first anointing was to overcome the flesh. The second anointing to overcome the soul. The third anointing was for him to walk in his destiny. We cannot receive the anointing to minister if we don't first have the anointing that brings transformation. The anointing heals. The anointing brings out what is hidden inside of you. The anointing causes you to shine. Can somebody say amen? So you and I must ask the Lord for the anointing because why? The anointing is the key for evangelism. Without the anointing, our evangelism will just become an evangelism program. with joy for me to convey the warmest love and regards from our senior pastor, Reverend Dr. Stephen Francis and Pastor Angeline as they're ministering this morning, the same time with us at 10 a.m. at Jesus Miking Church in Maryland. Before they continue and make their way to the United Kingdom, they send you their love, their regards, and most importantly, they ask that the church family will pray for them, for their journey in Maryland and also to the United Kingdom so that God's purposes will be accomplished for His glory. Can somebody say amen? amen? Can I ask everyone to please bow your head and we will say a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the presence of God, for your anointing that you are releasing over your temple. Lord, as we are about to hear what the Spirit of the Lord would speak to us, your people, we ask that you will give us a discerning heart, perceiving minds, Lord. Give us listening ears and seeing eyes that you will unveil to us the depth of the revelation of the Word of God that brings transformation and hope and encouragement for each and every one of us. Lord, we thank you that you have brought the family of Jesus, my King, who's not only in Shelby, but all around the world to partake together in what you have given unto us as a promise and as a vision. So therefore, we pray that the Word of God this morning will give each and every one of us that same passion and zeal to run and to chase after the Lord, to serve your house, and to be fully sold out and committed to do all that you have called us to be, to do all that you have willed us to do, and that all of us as a church body, we will consecrate our lives to prepare the way for the second coming of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that to Jesus my King Church, you have called this house to be a house of prayer. You have called this place to be a house of purity. You have called us to be a house of power. And you have called us to be a house of praise. So may the name of Jesus be so lifted high as we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor in Jesus' name. All God's people say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's open the Bible together. This morning I will speak to all of you with the title of my message being The Anointing. We want to talk about The Anointing. Somebody say with me, The Anointing. The anointing. I'm so thankful. And Miss Deborah, you have no idea that the scripture that you read for us from the book of Psalm 133 is the context in which I will be speaking in my message this morning. So I know the Lord is speaking. Amen. We want to talk about The Anointing first. I want to ask also for the church family in Shelby to pray for our office in Indonesia. Um, this coming week, March 7th to 9th, we will have the Voice of the Lord for Indonesia Prophetic Conference. It will be online. And so far, the team has updated that over 150 people have signed up. And God is just doing something wonderful in the ministry there. So Dr. Stephen has already recorded his message, the prophetic word which he has given. And when we were at the seven days of the Voice of the Lord in January, you have heard that the Lord has given many words concerning Indonesia. So we know that it is a strategic time for Indonesia. So please pray that this coming week, the three days online conference, it will be a strategic time where the word of the Lord will be spoken over the nation. Amen. Now, let's open our, the Bible together from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 4. Before later on in the message, we'll talk about Psalm chapter 133. Now, people of God, with all the things that are happening in America, 
and with the revival that is sweeping across college campuses, I want you and I to understand that the revival that is now upon us, we are in a time of revival. Somebody say amen. So you have to expect revival in your own personal life, revival in your family, revival in your church, because the way that God is going to move is going to be very different than how we suspect him going to move. But one thing that the Lord said, revival that is coming or the revival that is now upon us is not just about experiencing God, but it's about encountering God. Because encounters release revelation. God is bringing upon the face of the earth a fresh move that is not just going to be tingling on your body. It is not just bodily experience, but God is giving understanding. Because like what Pastor Stephen preached two weeks ago, the Lord does not want the church just to be on revival mode, but God wants us to be in transformation mode. Somebody say amen. amen. Revelation brings transformation. Encounter brings transformation. Not just experience, but we are encountering God in a new way. Now, why is it important for the church to arrive in this hour as champions before God? Look at the scripture. A few weeks ago, I'm not going to talk much about this. I'm going to save it for the following week. But the Lord gives an encouraging message that I'm so thankful for. You and I have to know that you and I are anointed people. Somebody say amen. amen. See, if you don't understand the anointing that is on your life, the call of God that is on your life, we are in big trouble. Why? The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 4, and there came out from the camp of the Philistine, a what? Why must God's champions arise? Because it is not only God who have his champions, the devil has his champions. And it's a showdown between God's champion and the enemy's champion. Goliath was explicitly said by the scripture, not only in this one verse. You'll continue reading 1 Samuel chapter 17 and multiple times he will be referred as the champions of the Philistines. So when the Lord says that God is looking for champions in his body, it is not just a word that is being flaunted. No, there is a reason why God is calling his people champions. You know, when you and I are champions, I ask the Lord. Now, the enemy has his type of champions. What kind of champion is God looking for? I found the scripture, Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. I want you to read it. Now, when Dr. Stephen was in Singapore last month, he touched on this. Do you know that if we proclaim that the Lord Jesus Christ is our champion, he is the champion above all champions, do you know that the Lord Jesus Christ, his name is Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus, the anointed one. That's who he is. What makes the Lord Jesus the champion that he is? The anointing that he carries. So if we are believers of the Lord Jesus Christ and we are Christians, it means we are following the anointed ones and the followers of the anointed one are also anointed. Somebody say amen. amen. Psalms chapter 2 verse 1 and 2 says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? Look, two things that the Lord says will happen, you will read. No, don't, don't continue uh, verse 2. Verse 1 first, okay? Follow where I'm going, Ben. Thank you. The, the Bible says, why do the nations rage? You know, one of the signature of the things that is happening across planet earth is that humans are raging with anger like this world has never seen before. That is the sign. But number two, in the same way, people are plotting so many evil things. The things that you and I cannot think or imagine 10 years ago, that are happening today. But you know what God is saying? They are plotting in vain. Two things that God is saying. You will see the rage of men. Why? Because when the devil will continue to push his plot, the plots are not going to be able to come to pass. Because why? God still have the upper hand. He is not done with touching the nations with His Holy Spirit fire. He is not done with the proclamation of the gospel with signs and wonders. Why? Because there is a, a, a multitude of people that will be harvested for His glory. Somebody say amen. But in verse 2, the Bible says in Psalms chapter 2 verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His. You see that? What will separate us from the world? The anointing. This psalm prophesied about it. Kings, rulers, governments, they are creating policies. Anything that is against the word of God, 
anything that is against the movement of the church. But God says, no, they will not be able to prevail against the Lord Jesus Christ, the commander of the Lord's army, and you and I, whom the Bible says we are the anointed ones. Somebody say amen. And the Bible says in this entire chapter that God wants us to arise because God has given the nations as your inheritance and my inheritance. Touch your neighbor and say, the purpose which God has for you is bigger than yourselves. Make sure they understand that. God has a bigger calling for your life. God wants you to become a blessing. You heard of many of the testimonies earlier. Why is it important to start with the people around you? Because if you can impact at least one soul for the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the beginning step in how you are activating faith inside of you. And you just never know that the one person that you are ministering to will be the next Billy Graham. You just never know that the one person that you're ministering to will be the next Apostle Paul. Can somebody say amen? So God is setting you and I apart based on what? The anointing. But what is the anointing? Sadly, in the church, many have abused the anointing. Sadly, in the church, we think anointing is equivalent to stardom. Some people think anointing is equivalent for us to suppress others. How many preachers have we heard in the name of the anointing they tie people's hands and force people to give. In the name of the anointing, they sabotage people's life. And so the Lord says many times the anointing has been abused. But the church, you and I, are prepared because the anointing that is from Christ is authentic, is genuine, it's much needed for what God has called us to be, what God has called us to do in these last days. Now, Psalms chapter 133. Are you ready? I have never looked at this psalm like the way the Lord has been explaining this psalm to me the past month. I've been dwelling on it. You know, since I was young in church, I listened to it. So many songs about, you know, this psalm. But I caught something new. Psalms 133, verse 1 to verse 3. Okay? I want to give you a, a, a few uh, things this morning that I pray will encourage you. We want to understand what is the purpose of the anointing. Why have God given the anointing to the church? Let's read the verse first. The Bible says, Psalms 133, 133. Okay. Okay, Ben, you can do it. Maybe Emmanuel can massage his shoulders a little bit so Ben is not uh, tensed up. Psalms 133, verse 1 to 3. The Bible says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. We'll touch about that. I always wonder, why did God compare unity with the anointing? Because it says, behold, in, 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 in verse 2, okay? Because it says in verse 2, it is like the precious oil on the beard, uh, on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. Verse 3, it says, it is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there, somebody say with me, there, the Lord has commanded the blessings and that is life forevermore. I want to share to you this morning in the office, just before I came to the sanctuary, the Lord says, do you know there is a prophecy about Jesus making church hiding in this scripture? I'll show you the verse from the book of Deuteronomy. But first, understand this. Let's go back to verse 1. The anointing is God's empowerment for you and I to do good. Okay, we need the anointing. Why? I saw something in the word good and the word pleasant. Because it says how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. In other words, without the anointing, we cannot be good. Good not in our own eyes, but good in God's eyes. See, without the anointing, when the church gives alms, we feed the homeless, right? We feed the hungry. What makes us so different then all the nonprofit organizations that are also feeding the hungry without the name of Jesus. You see that? If you and I don't carry the anointing, there is no difference. You and I, feeding the homeless, providing for the poor, providing clothing, without the anointing, there is not much different than others who are doing it, but not in the name of Jesus. A lot of people now, they think because they're frustrated, that's why. The anointing is supernatural. You know why? Uh, people keep on asking, why is young people not coming to the church? I tell you why. The answer is not trying to 
pull them in with whatever program. Show them the real deal. Show them that He is a God of power. Show them that God can heal. Miracles do happen. Somebody say amen. amen. Show them that there is liberty in Christ. That's how you win this generation. Not by gimmicks. If not, the church becomes another social club. Not much difference than YMCA. And many still prefer coming to the YMCA rather than to the church. The anointing makes the difference. Without the anointing, you and I are just doing good and that is not actually ministry. What we are doing is actually social work. Write this down. Without the anointing, we are not able to do the extraordinary. You see, the anointing empowers us to do extra, much more than what you and I are humanly capable. That's the anointing. What empowers promise? The testimony we have heard. That, you know, she was afraid. For people to just be free from fear, the com comparison there, she was not able to raise her hands. She felt the shyness. A good breakthrough would be she, she, she'll be able to make a presentation in front of her class. But not the case. She sang so beautifully. We got no clue that she can sing like that. <laughs> she acted with one of the most important parts in the play. You know what's happening there? It's not just promise going through a process because of counseling. The anointing kicks in. The anointing heals. The anointing brings out what is hidden inside of you. The anointing causes you to shine. Can somebody say amen? amen? So you and I must ask the Lord for the anointing because why? The anointing is the key for evangelism. Without the anointing, our evangelism will just become an evangelism program. But powerless. You and I need the anointing. The anointing is needed to see the changes, just like the testimony of promise. The anointing breaks the yoke. Whose yoke? Your yoke. The anointing first must change your life. The problem is now many believers, they are crying out to God for the anointing. But more, more than wanting to see God transform their life, they're more interested in pushing the anointing in someone's life. I'll show you later briefly why King David was anointed three times. The Lord showed me. The first anointing was to overcome the flesh. The second anointing to overcome the soul. The third anointing was for him to walk in his destiny. We cannot receive the anointing to minister if we don't first have the anointing that brings transformation. We need to understand that, people of God. Now, that is good. It says, behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity. What is pleasant? Pleasant, in, the word, in Hebrew, that word pleasant have the meaning of physically beautiful and sweetly sounding. Is that interesting? Oh, behold, how good and pleasant. And that word pleasant in the Hebrew have the meaning of something that is physically beautiful, something that is sweetly sounding. Watch this. Without the anointing, you and I cannot properly worship the Lord. I talked about social work and ministry. The anointing makes the difference. Without the anointing, you and I are not worshiping. We are just singing songs. Without the anointing, you're not worshiping. Without the anointing, you're just putting on a personal concert in your own room. Because the anointing makes the difference. The anointing makes your life pleasing unto the Lord. See, behold how good and what pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. The anointing sets us apart to be pleasing. The anointing, why is it the anointing given to us? Write this down. The anointing is given to us so that we can build an intimate life with Jesus. Why did the uh, woman who had the alabaster box anointed? That's the word that was used, right, in the scripture to anoint the feet of Jesus? Intimacy. The anointing of God is not just given to you from God for all the purposes that he has on earth but the anointing has been given to you so you can present it back unto the Lord. Amen. That's the working of the anointing. That's why all of us need that anointing. When we look at anointing, many times we focus on just the anointing to minister. It is good to admire servants of God who carry exceptional anointings from heaven. But don't focus on that. 
Make sure you are endowed by heaven the anointing that is customized for you so that you can serve and lavish Jesus with your love. You need that anointing. That anointing is more important because that anointing has no expiration date. The anointing to minister can stop. You know why? Because the purposes of God can shift as you grow older. You know, your effectivity will not be the same like how when you were 20, 25. The anointing to minister is given for a specific purpose, a specific assignment, and a specific season. But the anointing that you carry to wash the feet of Jesus, to lavish Him with your love, that has no expiration date. The anointing will get stronger before you see Jesus face to face. Can somebody say amen? Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. How many of us want to live a life that is good before God? You need the anointing. How many of us want to live a life that is pleasing unto the Lord? You need the anointing. And it says when brothers dwell in unity. You see that word brothers? When I did, uh, did a deeper research on the word brothers, the word brothers in the Hebrew, it means, you know what? Number one, write this down. Covenanted relationship. Now, it's good. We call brother, brother. Everybody in the church is brother. But that's not what God is looking for. It's not just, you're Christian? Brother, sister, brother, sister. No, that, not that kind of brothers. The brothers who dwell in unity, number one, they have a covenant with one another. Number two, belonging to the same tribe. That's why when you pick a church, pick a church because you are committed to the vision. Please. Jesus, my King Church will be around until Maranatha, Jesus comes back. What will guarantee you and I will remain in this church? The pastor? The programs? No. If that's our mindset, we will become grasshoppers jumping from church to church. What will root us in the body is when we are covenanted with the vision of the church. So number one, a covenant relationship. Number two, brothers means belonging to the same tribe. This is interesting. Number three, are you ready in the Hebrew? You resemble like one another. You are considered brothers. If that person whom you call brothers or sisters look like you and you look like them. Now, with that perspective in mind, just anyone dwelling in unity? Not everyone. People who share the same yoke and vision. That's why in true unity, breaking will take place inside of you. You will be broken by one another. Like what? Like the alabaster box. When you are involved with one another, in a place, in a community which God has for you, get ready. You will be broken and snapped so that the fragrance of Jesus will come out. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Like-minded people who look like one another, they hold hands together. The moment they pray in the name of Jesus, heaven moves. So we encourage you and we love you for coming to Jesus My King Church. But I think it, it speaks for all of us that we are not just satisfied with you coming as visitors. Because you and I have been called to run the race together for God's glory. Amen? That's why you need to mingle with one another. You need to share with one another. You stay behind and be vulnerable with one another. Why? Because the understanding of the concept that you and I belong to the same tribe who has put us in that tribe? Jesus. Somebody say with me, Jesus. Behold how good, how pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Now verse 2. Now it's compared to the anointing, you know. Watch this. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of, of, of his robes. Wow, I saw something. Write this down. The name Aaron means like bearer. You need the anointing so that you and I can become the light bearers that God has called us to be. Okay, now what will the anointing do? It says the anointing is on the head, right? Do you want to see how the operations of the anointing in one's life look like? Many times we feel, wow, that person is so anointed. 
Because the moment the person does this, everybody goes, ah. Right? Many people think the anointing operates like that. We always feel the anointing is spooky. You don't touch nobody and suddenly the person is fall. The anointing can manifest like that. But the scripture gives us a more understandable and applicable ways how the anointing can operate. Are you ready? The Bible says it is like precious oil on where? The head. Write this. There is five things on your head. Number one, the anointing starts to operate in your life when your mind is being renewed by heaven. Your perspective changed. You don't see things from your eyes anymore. The way that you think is now seeing from the lens of the word of God. What is operating? The anointing. What else that is on your head? Eyes. How does the anointing operate? Your eyes are open to see the riches of your spiritual inheritance in Christ Jesus. How does the anointing operate? Number three, you and I will be able to hear the voice of God. How many people are still saying, I struggle to hear the voice of God? Some more, they say, I don't think God can speak. That's a problem. The anointing operates in you. And how do you know the anointing is operating? Your ears being trained to be more sensitive in hearing the voice of God. If you cannot hear for somebody else, that's okay. At least you need to be able to hear for who? For yourself. Hear for yourselves. That's why in Christ Jesus, there is a future. I, I thank God for promise, Ariana going to Gardner Webb. Remember the four uh, youths from LA that first came to Shelby? They were like the first fruit until um, Jesus my King in Los Angeles is open. When they first came to Shelby for the voice of the Lord in 2021, none of them had a job. Two were struggling. They don't know what to do, where to go to school. I'm so proud to share their testimonies. One just got accepted, not in one university, but two. Another one is now working full-time in an elementary school and she's pursuing her degree in child development. Another one just got a job from working in a fast food Chick-fil-A, worked hard. He just got an offer. He's now working for an insurance company. Can you imagine? Number four, the last one. Struggled for one year. Couldn't go to nursing school. But she persisted and asked the Lord, persisted. Today, she's in a nursing school program on the way of becoming an LVN. Somebody say, praise the Lord. That's the anointing. The anointing changes your life. The anointing flips everything that is bad to be good. That's the anointing. The anointing changes you first. The anointing puts you in God's direction. That is the hope. How many people resort to coming to church enjoying it so much because they're actually running away from life problem? If you come to church as a runaway place, run away place, because you're not happy at home, you're not happy with your spouse, you're not happy with your job, and you insert yourself in church, this is where I feel like I'm accepted, and you start to exert yourself and wanting recognition, that's why we will always become troublemakers in the church. Because this is not a runaway place. The church is a place where God will build you, strengthen you. He will send you back out with greater clarity, might, and strength. Can somebody say amen? Amen. amen? amen. What is on your head? Nose. How does the anointing operate? The ability for you to discern better which is the will of God and which is not the will of God. And how do you know the anointing is operating in one's life? The words that a person speaks will become sweeter like honey. You know, there are certain people that the moment you talk with them, nothing positive comes out. It's always problem. One problem solved, you are not satisfied until you look out for the next problem. The mouth can never say, praise the Lord. All is good. Problem all the time. You need the anointing. The anointing will change you. Can somebody say amen? It says it's like precious oil on the head. That's why the head of light bearers needs to change first. You see, the anointing needs to change you first. Running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. I wondered, you know, wow, what a depiction. I try to picture it. The oil is poured so lavishly, it's all dripping everywhere, right? 
to the collar. You know what the word collar in the Hebrew is? Pay, mouth. I was shocked. Now a lot of scholars, people are drawing from the prophetic. The decade which we're in is in the decade of the mouth, right? What is God saying? There is a proclamation of the king of majesty and the king of glory that is coming on planet earth. But you and I cannot become the roar of the lion of Judah if we are not walking and operating in the anointing. See, coming down on the collar of his robes, that speaks of ministry. If the head is not first transformed, forget about ministry. Can somebody say amen? Can somebody say amen? Now verse 3, watch this. In verse 3, it is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. I thank God, you know. When the Lord established this place, we thank God for Shelby, North Carolina. But the place which God pointed to Dr. Stephen Francis is a place called the King's Mountain. You know, when the dew of Hermon from a high elevation, it falls, the mountains of Zion are still a high elevation. You see what I'm saying? God is about to release something from heaven to planet earth. And there are those that God has called to be on the mountains of God. So you and I are not living just an ordinary Christian life. But it's a, there is a dimension of authority that God is releasing and preparing us for. For there, what does the Bible say? The Lord has commanded the blessing. You know, when I saw this, the Lord says this. Write this down. In these end times, the church that is anointed will learn to walk under the commanded blessings of heaven. Recession? Inflation doesn't matter. Wherever the blessings of God is commanded, you and I shall lack nothing that is good. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, this is the promise that when I read it this morning, I said, yes, Lord, this is for Jesus, my King. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 8 to verse 14. Oh, hallelujah. I love it, man. When God commands His blessing, you don't beg for it. He commands it. It must be done. When God commands it, nobody can take it away from you. Nobody can steal it. Nobody can say otherwise. God commands His blessing. Oh, Deuteronomy 28 verse 8. Watch this, watch this. Woo. Aren't we about to build a prayer barn? We are about to build a prayer barn, right? And you know what this scripture says? The Lord will command the blessings on you in your barns. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some people are wondering, man, Rivers of Life is just in Shelby for three years. How come you're planting so many churches? Because God says the Lord will command the blessings on you in your barns and in all, somebody say all, all. that you undertake for God's glory. He will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You know what's one of the signs of the people moving to this area? You're buying property. The Lord will establish you as a holy people. Verse 9, Ben, verse 9, you're right. Holy to himself as he has sworn to you if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. What we need to do is walk. Somebody say with me, walk. Now I understand, you know, why in this church everybody's encouraged to serve? From Isaiah 43, during communion just now. In the new thing that God is doing, he's preparing for you a way. If God is showing you a way, but you just remain on the starting point, no matter how beautiful that way is, you are still in the starting point. God says, I'm making a way for you to do what? Wait and see. Walk. Walk in it. Walk in the ways of God. The work that God has in this place is a new thing. It's still baby stage. That's why it takes hard work. It takes labor. Anything new that God does is not voila, bam, wow. No, 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 no. Small. Jesus was the new that heaven have declared on planet earth when he first came, right? Where was he born? The smallest town called Bethlehem. God showed us, you know, the path of the kingdom. That's why Jesus kept on saying, you want to be big? Start small. You want to be big? Remain faithful. 
if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in His ways. Verse 10. The Bible says in verse 10. Watch this. In verse 10. Next. And all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord. Oh, this is important. Name in the Hebrew means character. In other words, character, the nature of God. All the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the nature of God. And they shall be afraid of you. You want to talk about many dangers in these end times? Don't worry. Don't be afraid. Those who don't know Christ, they'll be afraid. And you're not going to abuse that authority. You know that when God is on your side, nobody can withstand you. Amen. Amen. Verse 11. Let's continue to verse 14. And the Lord will make you abound in prosperity. Oh, in the fruit of your womb. So many babies are being born in Jesus' making, isn't it? Yeah. That's why I'm seeing it all here, man. And in the fruit of your livestock. Pastor Stephen kept on talking about chickens. <laughs> and in the fruit of your ground. Within, somebody say me with me, within, within the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. If God is saying within the land, there is something about the land in North Carolina. You're in a land that has been covenanted with God. Verse 12, and let's continue to verse 14 quickly. The Lord will open to you His good treasury, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hands. I'm telling you in Jesus' name, receive it. If you have been struggling with anything in your life, get under the vision and God will prosper the works of your hands. Catch it. Catch the prophetic promise. It's yours. You're here not by accident. God has called you here. And you shall lend to many nations. But you shall not borrow. It's happening, you know. The mission support that has been, we've been giving to so many nations out there. We went to Colombia. Where is it from? This land. The nations are being blessed. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall only go up and not down. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, being careful to do them. Verse 14, the last part it says, and if you do not turn aside from any of the words that I command you today, to the right hand or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. Watch that. What is the key to making all this work? Serve the Lord. If we are not serving God, the tendency will be we'll be serving other gods. Whether you like it or not. Because you have to serve a master. It's either the master or the other masters. Can somebody say amen? amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Another scripture I want to give you. Isaiah chapter 21. Verse 1 to verse 5. Are you being blessed this morning church? Yes. Isaiah 21. Something is happening. The Lord is releasing a fresh anointing upon His people. Oh, hallelujah. God has called us to be a prophetic church. The oracle concerning the wilderness of the sea. As whirlwinds in Negev sweep on. It comes from the wilderness from a terrible land. Next verse. A stern vision. Mm. A lot of people want to see vision and dreams. Do you know that with every prophetic anointing, there is always a challenge that you have to withstand. A stern vision is told to me, the traitor betrays, the destroyer destroys, go up, O Elam, lay siege, O media, all the sighing she has caused, I bring to an end. You know, when I read this scripture, you and I, that's why we keep on saying, don't be alarmed by what's happening in the world. Don't be alarmed. Balloon flying there, balloon fly. Don't be alarmed. Any more ridiculous things will happen. You know why? Because the devil will do what he do best. He will remain to be a traitor. He will remain to destroy. You see, this is the balance that the prophetic people must know. The more God shows you visions and dreams and the prophetic anointing kicks in, you need to be able to handle yourself so that the visions that you see will not impact you the wrong way. A lot of people, oh, I see this. Oh, I see that. Oh, the Lord showed me this. Oh, the Lord showed me that. 
God is saying from this scripture, the devil will continue to do what the devil does. You don't worry about them. Verse 1 to verse 4, you will see the enemy do what the enemy will do. That will not change. But verse 5, that's where you and I come in. This is my meditation for the past few days. <laughs> they prepare the table. You know what? The enemy, the enemy does it. Prepare a table, spread the rocks. They eat and drink. But God is saying, arise, O princess, and oil your shield. When the, your enemy is preparing a table, your enemy is thinking nobody can stop us, your enemy is plotting things like in the book of Psalms chapter 2, they're preparing a table. I am reminded in Isaiah 21 verse 5, there is another scripture, Psalm 23 verse 5. When your enemy is preparing a table, God is preparing a table for you. You see that? They want to prepare a table, let them. Because when they're preparing their table, God is preparing a table for you. Amen. And now God is saying, oil your shield. What is God saying? Oil your faith. It is not enough just for you and I to become regular Christians, people of faith. Become anointed faith people. People who's anointed with the zeal of God. Don't settle for ordinary Christianity. Wrong timing. God is saying, oil your faith. Believe God for deeper things. Believe God for greater things. You know why? Champions are made for battle. I see the parallel, you know. In this verse, the enemy is preparing tables. Rugs, they eat, they drink. In Psalm 23 verse 5, it says, What? He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. He anoints my head with... You see that? The anointing is in both scripture. The anointing is for battle. And you know what God calls these people? He says to his people, arise, right? Go back to Psalm 21, Ben. I mean, Isaiah 21. Isaiah 21. Go back to Isaiah 21. I see the, you see the comparison. But in this scripture, God is saying, arise, oh, princess. You and I are no longer just an ordinary person in God's army, but princes. A higher degree of authority will be released by heaven for you and I. Amen? Now, when we look at the anointing, especially, you know, a worshiper, I, I mentioned to you, we like to glean from the life of King David. First Samuel chapter 17, who did God use to fight against the champion of the Philistines? This man named David. I want you to just write it down, okay? No time for us to discuss this part. Three times David was anointed. Anointing number one, when he was anointed by the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 16. I shared to you just now, that is the anointing for transformation. Overcoming the flesh. When David was anointed first time by Samuel, man, he faced Goliath, he faced Saul, he had to run to Adullam, he was being chased in Ziklag, his own army wants to kill him, his wives and his children were ransomed, remember that? But what was the anointing doing in David's life? The anointing was transforming him. The anointing taught David how to overcome his own flesh. Number two, he was anointed in Hebron. What is that anointing? The anointing for consecration. You see, a lot of people think, well, I'm praying a lot. I'm praying a lot. All I do is worship. I don't do anything else. And then if we feel holy because of that, it doesn't work like that. Consecration comes after transformation. Consecration does not replace transformation. That's why you have a lot of people who's praying a lot, but the moment you talk to them, how come I can't connect with you? Your thinking is haywire because they feel consecration replaces transformation. No, transformation, the working of God cannot be replaced. God will break you. He will remove that impatience out of us. He will remove the anger out of us. He will remove the pride out of us. When you allow Holy Spirit to transform you, He'll anoint you next to consecrate you. When David was anointed as king over Judah in Hebron, what happened? David had to deal a lot with the families of Saul. You know what he's dealing this time? The soul. David was consecrated by God so that his soul remains pure before heaven. 
Amen? Learning to harness our emotions. And number three, when King David was anointed over king, over the entire nation and kingdom of Israel, what is that? That is the anointing that is given. Not only now your flesh, your soul, but your spirit is being anointed to do what? The anointing for ministry. When David was king over nation Israel, what was his thinking about? How to build a house for my master. It's always building the kingdom, establishing. Why do you need the anointing to help you to harness you? When David was doing so many things that he wanted to do for God, did he make a couple of mistakes? Yes, he did. And actually in the end, the very thing he wanted to do, he didn't get the chance to do, which is to build God a house. Do you know sometimes when we feel the anointing over us, we feel like we can do anything and everything. But the moment we are not learning how to yield under the leading of the Spirit, that anointing will kill you. What if David pushed to build the building? We don't know. But he did not. That anointing empowered David to surrender his yield, his zeal for God. He said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. The Lord Jesus Christ, the anointing was in its height when in Gethsemane he said, Father, not my will, your will. What empowered him? The anointing. Not the miracles anymore, not the feeding of the 5,000 anymore, not all that. Yielding, not my will, but your will. The intensity of the anointing was at its peak. Because what he did on the cross for us is the greatest miracle. You can't compare it with anything else. But look at that. The greatest miracle had no flair. The greatest miracle had no glamour. The greatest miracle was when we come back to the point of death to self. Can somebody say amen? What empowers us? The anointing. Before we close, let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I hope you're encouraged here today. Somebody say together with me, I am anointed. Say it like you mean it. I am anointed. You are. Don't believe anything else. You are anointed. Your brothers and sisters, they're anointed. Why? Because we follow the anointed one. And his name is Jesus. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 37 to 51. Six aspects. I just, you, as we go through the scriptures, I want you to see some things that we can learn from the life of David. And I pray will encourage you, okay? The six, the six aspects of the anointing. 1 Samuel 17, verse 37 and so forth. The Bible says, and David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go and the Lord be with you. Write this down. The anointing is released when you learn to testify what God has done in your life. Why is testimony important? Because testimony stirs the anointing. David didn't have any list which battle he won. All he did was testify what God did for him with the bears and the lions. He said, God will do it again. There is power in your testimony. I feel many of you carry a testimony. And this is what the Lord is telling me right now. Many of you have a testimony that you wanted to share, but you're ashamed or you feel like your testimony is insignificant compared to somebody else's testimony. I pray today, break free from that lie in Jesus' name. Boldly declare your testimony because your testimony is the way which the anointing will increase in your life. Testimony is not just sharing of what God has done. It is unlocking the pathway and the doorway for God to do greater things through your life in the days to come. Hallelujah. Amen? Now, it says this. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head, clothed him with a coat of mail. Such an ancient clothing for, an, um, for a warrior in the olden times. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. Verse 39. Continue, Ben. And David strapped his sword over his armor and he tried in vain to go, for he had not what? tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. 40. Then he took his staff in his hand, 
chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. Point number two, the anointing will always provoke flattery from others. This is the warning from God. Do not put on something that God has not tested in your life. A lot of people think, I'm anointed. I can do what that person is doing. I can sing like that. I can minister like that. Be careful. Sometimes because we feel, man, I feel the anointing of God. We feel that we can change the world. But don't put on something that God has not tested inside of you. You'll die. This is the fallacy of comparison. You know, the moment you start operating God's anointing in your life, somebody will say, wow, your prayer was so anointed. Wow, do you know how good you were? That creates flair. Ooh, people is saying I can do it. Man, I can make it. Then because of that, we get duped by people like Saul, who only wanted the glory for himself, did not care for David's well-being. If David has went to war, with Saul's armor, you know what will happen to David? He'll die. Don't put on something that God has not tested in you. David could have said, man, I got the armor of the king. Top guy. But God has not tested him yet. Don't put on anything that the Lord has not broken you with. Every anointing have its own challenges. Every anointing have its own testimony. And every anointing will require different sets of skills. Let God develop that. Anointing is not just, oh, it's God moving. No, no, no. The anointing is so precious, it's contained. You know what I love about this? In verse 40, he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. Guess what? How many of you, of you and I want to become like the smooth stone in David's pouch? How many of you and I want to be in our great shepherd's pouch? You know, when David took the smooth stone, he didn't take out all five and say, "Ini, miny, minimo, I choose you. No, he didn't do that. He put his hand inside the pouch, took out the first stone, and that first stone, bam, hit the temple of Goliath. God is raising up a breed of people that we don't care who gets chosen. All we want to be is in the shepherd's pouch. Mm. We want to be discipled by the great shepherd. Anyone the great shepherd pulls out, bam, will destroy the work of the enemy. That's the kind of army that God is raising up in these end times. The five stones didn't have a name. What's the key? Be in the shepherd's pouch. You want to be a strong prophetic warrior? Be in the leading of the great shepherd. Anyone he draws out from his pouch will inflict great damage to the kingdom of darkness. Oh, hallelujah. Can somebody say amen? amen. Love, your love is always measured after each testing. Okay, continue. Verse 41 to 42. And the Philistine moved towards forward and came near to David with a shield bearer in front of him. Verse 42. What is verse 42? And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. Oh, write this down. The anointing will make you youthful and vibrant in God. The anointing keeps you fresh. The devil hates what God loves. You can read it at home. I'll give you the scripture. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 12. The same depiction of David was mentioned. When Samuel went to, um, to Esai's house, remember that story? He looked at all David's older brothers. Not that one, not that one, not that one. The scripture says in 1 Samuel 16, the moment David appeared, it's the same depiction. Young, ruddy, and handsome. God was so pleased with what he looked at, he blessed David. The devil hates the very thing that God loves about you. You know why he's after your family? You know why he's after your finances? He hates it when you're blessed. He hates it when your marriage is restored. 
He hates it if your children is happy. Then why many times we neglect that? Oh. The anointing will make you youthful, vibrant in God. That's the effect of the anointing. Nothing to do with age. The anointing helps us to remain fresh. Somebody say with me, fresh. In all seasons, you are fresh. Point number four. Just three more. Okay, we'll continue. The Philistine said to David, am I a dog? Oh, Goliath got so mad at David and said all the things he said. Let's jump, continue, verse 44 and onwards, okay? Continue, verse 45. It says in verse 40, then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in what? In the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the angel armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Point number four, write this down. The anointing makes you bold. The anointing makes you unafraid. Your enemy can be big, but you know what? You know one thing I learned from this? Remember the army of Israel, when this Goliath show up, were not the entire army of Israel so afraid of the Philistines? David broke the mold. He broke the mold. He came without any armor. And he declared, I come in the name of the Lord of hosts. More than talking to the enemy, David was talking to the army of Israel. You foolish bunch of people. You've been looking in your armor. You've been looking at your weapons. No, change the weapon. Come in the name of the Lord. My God. So don't be afraid. Sometimes we feel, I don't have that person scared of skills. I don't have that person's experience. No, all you need is the anointing. You show them the way. Can somebody say amen? David established the authority of God as the absolute authority. And that is the rules of engagement that the nation of Israel must abide under. You know what David established? He established the fear of God and the importance of trusting God to the army of Israel. Many times the enemy has won. Why? Because the enemy has fooled us by thinking that battles are won because of our own might. How many times we give up because we feel I'm not good enough. I won't make it. I'm gonna lose. But you know what God is doing? He's changing the rules of engagement. Don't fight with your might. Call upon my name. Invoke who I am. Say who I am. The battle belongs to you. Can somebody say amen? And point number five. Let's continue. Verse 46. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down, cut off your head. I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Oh, that's a powerful statement, man. His job is only one. I want to make sure my God is known throughout the earth. Verse 47. The Bible says, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Continue, 40, 48, just a few more verses. When the Philistines arose, came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. Verse 49, and David put his hand in his back, took out a stone, slung it, struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. Somebody say, hallelujah. Write this, the anointing will empower you to win the battle of the mind. Okay? Strongholds first fall when that stronghold is fallen in your mind. Amen? And last but not least, you'll continue verse 51 and onwards. What did David do? David ran, stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew out of its sheath, killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistine saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Oh, oh. You know why God's champion is so important? Well, you know why we must rise? The moment Goliath fell, the entire army fled. You know what empowered Goliath? Not his big body, the powers of darkness. 
it was like a spell that came. You know when Goliath starts taunting Israel, what was he doing? He's throwing word curses. So David knew the way to win this guy is not by weapons. It's a spiritual warfare. When their champion was dead, everybody fled. I am proclaiming in the name of Jesus that our champion in Christ Jesus will rise like never before on planet earth and every knee must bow in Jesus' name. You, f you see that our children is under attack in America. Our education system is under attack. God is calling champions, arise. All right. God has anointed you and I not to become headless chickens in these last days, but to win the war for His glory. The last point, write this down. The anointing empowers you to take back all that the enemy has taken away from you. Say no to the enemy. Say no to the devil. Say no to all the lies of the enemy. You will have your children back. You will have your grandchildren back. You have everything that the enemy has taken away from you. That is your inheritance. You are anointed. You know why we are anointed? Because we are called to represent the anointed one. Christian is a very heavy name, you know. Followers of the anointed one. Sometimes we just say followers of Christ, right? But what's the meaning of Christ? The anointed one. So Christians are followers of the anointed one. Yes. You and I are designed not to lose, but to win. I like what is being said just now. So the name of Jesus will be made so famous. So famous. Can you just lift up your hands and say it together with me? Lord Jesus, make your name famous in me and through me for your glory. Let's rise in the presence of God. Hey friends, thank you so much for watching this message. We trust that you've been tremendously blessed. If you have not done so, subscribe to the YouTube channel of Jesus My King, for we will be posting many more insightful programs that will surely help you in your journey with God. Tune in every Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time for our live Sunday service here from Shelby, North Carolina. God bless and we'll see you soon. God has given us strategies and training through the anointing of fragrance and prayer. To make a purchase, visit us online at stephenfrancis.org.